this is in some sense just going even deeper into the complexities that I was hinting at earlier. Um, I want to get everybody used to talking about multiple criteria and kind of complex solutions to these questions because there generally aren't simple solutions. So I just, again, this is just kind of going deeper, okay? Um, and some of this we've already touched on, but um, I'll give a little bit better illustration now. So I think one very important thing is that whatever your goals are, could be you know, dampening the effects of climate change, or it could be saving the species of, of beetles of your country. Whatever the, whatever the goal is, you need to make sure that the indicators that you use as a guide to how you're going to achieve that goal are good indicators of whatever, it, whatever quantity you're trying to, to maximize or optimize. So for example, we might have indicators that are very easy to obtain, very commonly obtained. I just threw out three, species diversity, forest cover, or let's say population of lions, right? Or whatever big charismatic species. But we may have very different goals. We may have goals of conserving all of biodiversity or just lions. Or we may have a goal of, of carbon storage. But it's really important to make sure that you're using indicators to achieve, the right indicators to achieve your goals. So let's take a really simple example. Um, can't see it as well as I wish we could, but um, this is Lake Kivu going kind of west and northwest into the mountains. I just picked it out as an example. There's, I didn't have any data about the region. But if you could see more of this, you could see that the mountains are forested and the lower areas near the lake are clearly an agricultural matrix. And so, maybe we can go in and get a view of species diversity across that gradient. This is all hypothetical. This is just to get you thinking. And here, here's my measurement of species diversity for a bunch of points along this gradient. And so if our goal is biodiversity conservation, then we might use this as a very clear indicator of where we should invest our, our resources, right? Where? Here? Everybody's asleep after lunch. Here? <laughs> that is obviously too high species diversity. Where the species diversity is lowest. So you want to invest your biodiversity conservation money here? No. Why? For me, because I'm looking at, if you're looking at species diversity as the only indicator, that table has, that shows that is the lowest species diversity, and that is an interface of bias. So you'd want to have a very high species diversity in that space. Okay, but yeah. if I give you enough money to buy one, I don't know, thousand hectare parcel of land. Away from that place, because too much human development. Okay, so where do you want to be? Here, here, or here? Yes. Over here. Yes. Why? I'll go for the middle. In the middle. Ah, in the middle. Yeah. Because species diversity is highest. Yeah. Okay, well that's a, that's, a, that's a good reasoning. <laughs> of course I'm going to disagree with you. Come around here, hold on. For me, <coughs> if you give me that amount of money, I would go closer to the lake. Where okay. the species diversity is uh, very low. Okay, why? Because I need to restore the, um, the site and uh, make sure the, 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 sp the species increase the diversity increase and reach the, the, the middle is intact. It is, it is, the species are healthier, they are in security. Okay, no so threats. you're basically saying the lowlands near the lake 
because that's where we have the most disturbance yeah, yeah. and probably those species are most threatened or most in low population. Sure. Okay, also good reasoning. Mm -hmm. Any other, anybody vote for up in the mountains? Yeah, I think uh, given the graph, I would expect the low altitude expect too much human activities. Some in the middle we call sub, sort of submontans where at least pretty much of uh, conducive environment is available. On top, we expect harsh condition to wind, the cold, and this kind of thing. So, some in the middle is where you expect too much of diversity and better condition. And to me, if you are to choose, then that should be the area because of those conditions. Okay. Nobody votes for the mountains. No. Ah. Thank you. For me, it would depend on the purpose. Okay, but we said biodiversity conservation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't care about carbon storage. I say the purpose because conservation is broad. Okay. Maybe if I start from the, the side nearby the lake, conservation might be focusing on restoration. Right. I agree. In case I invest my money in that area to restore the degraded the mm -hmm. ecosystem. It might be also the maintenance of a healthy ecosystem. Mm -hmm. In that case, my money will go in the middle because that is a healthy ecosystem that has to be maintained for a long time. Maybe it might, it might be for the stability ecosystem. For me, I may find, even though the one in the middle is at the, the top level, but uh, the, the one nearby the Rhine is more stable considering the Rhine. So okay. that stability has to be maintained for a long period of time and maybe with the main purpose towards the high level like the one in the middle. So conservation is broad and my money shall be invested depending on the goal and the focus in conservation. Okay. I did say that my goal is just to conserve the complete set of species present in that region. I gave you three options, but there really is a fourth. Yes. What's, what's the fourth, Jess? The places over the graph is changing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I could give you five options, but, but the, the additional option that I was thinking of is I don't have enough information yet. I really need to know the local distributions of the species that are involved. And I also need to know their broader distributions. It may be that the species that are down in the lowlands go all the way to Malawi. And they have big ranges. And the species in the mountains have small ranges. It may be that there's a very unique mid-montane group, or it may be that this is just an ecotone. Okay? I don't know because on purpose I didn't give you enough information. Here's more information. These are the distributions of all of my species. Now with that information, anybody want to change his or her decision? And why? So here's our zone of highest diversity. But what we see is that that is the upper limits for all the lower species and the lower limits for all the upper species. It's an ecotone. So even though there are more species there, all of them are kind of at their extreme for one reason or the other. Again, this is just a made up example. So really where we want to put our money might be driven by those two, which are the species with the narrowest ranges. <coughs> Again, I, d I trapped you guys, I admit it, right? I tried you to, I gave you three options and nobody offered me the fourth option. But it's okay to say I don't have enough information, right? I mean, that was, that was one of the things that was brought up in the panel discussion yesterday. I don't remember if it was from the public or from the panel, but somebody said, why don't we just start using the information that we have? And that's a good, that's a good question. 
And you know, Matt gave us some cool examples from South Africa, but South Africa has, what, three orders of magnitude more records. I mean, they, in some sense, they have critical mass, enough to, enough to do something with. And from what I saw of you know, the digital accessible knowledge for Rwanda, and Jesse, you'll remember I did the same thing with Kenya, you, there's a point where you just say, no, I don't have enough information, okay? And you may have to explicitly use other criteria. But I just, I just wanted to bring that out. Then I wanted to give you a series of examples of some of these questions. Here's a study of restoration of ecosystem services and biodiversity, conflicts and opportunities. It's a review, obviously. But they're contrasting, um, if I have a grassland and I wanna return it to being a tradi traditional hay meadow, just a, you know, a, a basically a, an open area that is not used intensively, versus a non-native tree pop plantation. And it's, a, it's kind of interesting, you know, native species richness is increased here and is much decreased there. Productivity in terms of, you know, tons of, of, of um, vegetative mass, much higher in the non-native non tree plantation. Carbon sequestration, somewhat higher. And water availability, much decreased. So all of these different things vary independently or, or at least not, not strictly in concert. And I actually found a, a, a neat map, which I hadn't seen when it came out. Global conservation of biodiversity and ecosystem services. And what they've done is to map global biodiversity priorities, and they have a whole, um, a whole derivation of those priorities, and ecosystem service value, okay? And these are tough maps to create because they wanna show biodiversity priority, and they show that as getting redder, and then they want to show ecosystem services value, and they show that as getting greener. Where the two co-vary, it's gray, which goes from white down here to black up here. So all of the black places on this map are places that are high priority for both, and all of the white places on this map are low priority for both. And all of the red places, this is, this is the interesting thing, the red places are places that have high biodiversity value but low ecosystem services value. And all of the green places are places with high ecosystem services value and low biodiversity value. Now, we could argue with all of the inputs, okay? But if these, two, this is what I was asking Amelie about earlier, if these things co-varied, it would just be a map of whites, grays, and blacks. But look at how much color we see up there. That means that these things are varying independently, at least how they have measured it. Sorry, you had a question. Okay. I remember the question you asked it in the morning. Uh -huh. It is not uh, necessary where there is biodiversity that there is values for ecosystem services. Now, you see where it is uh, red, you see it is where there is high biodiversity and the less ecosystem services. Mm -hmm. how, how can we explain it? While uh, Mariani said, and uh -huh. um, Emily said, um, when she was introducing the ecosystem services, mm -hmm. biodiversity occupies the big table. The, do you remember? Mm -hmm. Which means the ecosystem services are provided by biodiversity. That is true. That's true. And they, they are, there is biodiversity but less ecosystem services. How, what, how, what? In a way you're falling into a trap of using two different meanings of the word biodiversity. 
the ecosystem services are provided by elements of biodiversity, uh -huh. but that doesn't mean they have to be a native plant or a rare endemic plant versus something that grows fast. I mean, think about bamboo or, or eucalypts, okay? They grow really quickly, they're incredibly productive, but in a biodiversity sense that we would talk about in terms of conservation, they have no value, okay? That, uh, yeah, it also depends how you measure value. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not taking into account all the external costs, then this falls apart, basically. Hmm. How we measure value. And then now this comes to the answer you gave to my, my colleague, that the monetary value is not necessarily the one to convince the decision makers, rather intrinsic values. So now well, comes another, another it's, it's all connected. If you, re, if you build your whole argument on mm -hmm. monetary value, then your whole argument can fall apart if you're really interested in biodiversity conservation. Because maximizing the monetary value may not necessarily maximize the effectiveness in biodiversity conservation. Okay? All that I'm after is to impress you that this is complex. So, yes. <laughs> okay? Okay, so, again, kind of looking at this map, what impressed me, look at the black areas. The Amazon Basin, the Congo Basin, the humid forests of West Africa, some areas in, in Southeast Asia, okay? They're all forested. Okay, and they're all places that are highly dissected. So notice, you know, forested areas in Siberia really win more on ecosystem services rather than on both. Okay? Anyhow, this is, this is a neat map. And I, I, I enjoyed the map so much I almost didn't want to go and look at the nuts and bolts because I would definitely have some argument or something I wouldn't like about, about how they'd done it. But it's just a neat map to think about. So we're going to go a little bit deeper into kind of conservation prioritization questions. So this isn't so much um, ecosystem services or essential biodiversity variables, but rather one of the goals that you might use that information towards. And here again, I want to impress you with the fact that it's complicated. These are multi-criterion decisions. These are complex decisions. And they may require quite a bit of information. The conservation end, kind of beyond what's perhaps our role in the process, also requires a lot of marketing, OK? And this is a great example of marketing. The biodiversity hotspots, I think the concept was published in 1989, maybe. Um, thousands and thousands of citations, millions and millions of dollars, at least donated and hopefully invested in the conservation. Sorry, 1988. But to qualify as a hotspot, a region must meet two strict criteria. It must contain at least 1,500 species of vascular plants. So that's a species diversity thing. And it has to have lost at least 70% of its original habitat. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting thing. So look at this map and think back to the previous map. What big differences do you remember? What were the two biggest areas that were big on biodiversity value and big on um, ecosystem services? The yeah, the Amazon and the Congo. And notice that neither of them 
is a biodiversity hotspot according to Conservation International. And that is because they've certainly got the biodiversity value and the plant diversity. At least 20 years ago, they didn't have the threat. Now the Amazon is in pretty bad shape right now because Brazil wanted to equal the United States in choice of bad president, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we have a president that we could put up against any bad president in the world, but Brazil really came close to, to taking that, that honor away from us. So right away, you realize that by putting two criteria together, we're missing some really important things. If I'm gonna invest my $10 billion in conservation, do I really not want to put a single dollar into the Congo or the Amazon? Really? But it's because these two criteria are mixed. Wouldn't it be better to have a map of the plant species richness and separately a map of threat? Somebody brought this up earlier where down near Lake Kivu, I'm in a restoration or even emergency rescue situation. And up in the mountains, I may be more in a preservation of big intact systems. So we know some big tendencies. We know that there's high diversity at low latitudes near the equator and low diversity at high latitudes. We know that there's high endemism where we have a lot of subdivision and segregation. Okay, so think of Indonesia, for example. Tropical region that's all carved up into little islands. And then we also know that there's a lot of variation among continents and among regions. Okay, so those are kind of big patterns. They're pretty consistent patterns. They don't do you much good as far as what do you do you know, here in Rwanda or even here in Africa, right? Because we need the detail. So another bit of marketing. I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of conservation marketing things. Another big concept that came out was the mega diverse countries. And a lot of them make sense. You know, Brazil, India, China, DRC. Can anybody tell me why the U.S. is on there? I mean, we have a fair amount of endemism in the southeast, but it's not on the same scale. I'm guessing it's politics, right? Um, Nothing in Africa other than DRC in South Africa? Yeah. I mean, I think here what's going on is in the Congo you have one big country. Yes. And in West Africa you have lots of small countries. Right? That's another bit of marketing. Endemic bird areas. This one's from BirdLife International. You can see key habitats of endemic bird areas, and then you see these points across the globe. Oh my gosh, look at that, the Congo's left out again. Right? The Amazon has, I think there's one or two in there. Um, World Wildlife Fund Global 200 Ecosystems. Aha. This one's a bit more extensive, covers some of those areas better. But of course, saying you need to preserve rainforest. Well, is this rainforest better, or is this rainforest, or this rainforest better? Or which three rainforests? Or which 20 rainforests? And come back to our hotspots and the definition 
And again, it's this combination of criteria. So one of the things, and this kind of takes us back to those, those EBV maps. We have to be very careful of making maps that are so synthetic that they cover over real patterns. Okay? Because when I ask why is a particular hotspot included or why is this other place not included, I don't know if it's because of vascular plant diversity or because of threat. But the marketing has really worked. And here are numbers of citations and it's, it goes you know, literally through the roof um, through time. People really grabbed onto this concept, even though it's not a particularly informative concept. So hotspots can, in theory, shift although the owners of the hotspot concept wouldn't want it to because they have used that as their fundraising mechanism and their, as their guide, the threats and impacts change and the knowledge of all of these things is improving generally. You know, the Amazon was doing actually better eight to 10 years ago because um, Brazil had a really neat forest protection legislation. It basically said no further forest destruction. And the present president is saying, you know, burn it. And it's, it's pretty, pretty bad. So, you know, these are, these are interesting maps. And at the same time, they're frustrating. <coughs> so what I'm after is to get you guys to read the fine print and think about it. You know, you don't just look at the map and believe it, but instead you look at the map and you say, if I understand that this is this, then why isn't that also included? Or why is this included? And we don't do enough of that. And that's not you guys, it's everybody. So that was global. Let's go down a scale and let's look in Mexico. Okay? You'll see a lot of Mexican examples from me. Um, it's a place where I've worked now for 31 years. 